Uh, good morning, church family. My name is David. Today's reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 22 through 36. Please follow along in your own Bibles or simply listen as the scriptures are read. Again, that's John, chapter 3, starting with verse 22. Following the reading, I invite you to respond in worship with the singing of the doxology. Parents and guardians of children in preschool through fourth grade, you are invited to escort your kids to the back of the room to join Kids Commons. As you are able, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. <clears throat> Hear the word of the Lord. Then Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem and went into the Judean countryside. Jesus spent some time with them there, baptizing people. At this time, John the Baptist was baptizing at Anon near Salem because there was plenty of water there and people kept coming to him for baptism. This was before John was thrown into prison. A debate broke out between John's disciples and a certain Jew over ceremonial cleansing. So John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, is also baptizing people and everybody is going to him instead of coming to us. John replied, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you, I am not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success he must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. He has come from above and is greater than anyone else. We are of the earth, and we speak of earthly things. But he has come from heaven and is greater than anyone else. He testifies about what he has seen and heard, but how few believe what he tells them. Anyone who accepts his testimony can affirm that God is true, for he is sent by God. He speaks God's words, for God gives him the spirit without limit. The father loves his son and has put everything into his hands. And anyone who believes in God's son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, parents and guardians of children, preschool through fourth grade, you're invited to escort your kids to Kids Commons. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please have a seat. Hello, good morning. It's great to be back here with you this morning here at Haverhill Commons. I'm one of the pastors here at this church. It's awesome to be worshiping with you this morning. Um, Megan and I were away last weekend. Um, I know you guys missed us like crazy. We were away last weekend. Uh, we went up to Bar Harbor for the first time since we've lived in Massachusetts. Uh, we had no kids with us. I repeat, there were no kids with us. Um, it was a minor miracle. It took a lot of assistance from a lot of you in order for us to make that happen. So I Really want to thank you. It was a really rich and rewarding time for us, a huge gift. So thank you for those of you that helped us. Um, we feel so cared for by you guys, so thank you. Um, but I am excited to be back here with you this morning, excited to open God's word together. As we do that, let's still our hearts and still our minds so that we can ask the Lord to meet us here in this moment exactly as we are in this exact moment. So please join me at the moment of silence and reflection. Father, Son, Spirit, 
Open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts this morning that we might receive from you your truth. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So this morning we're continuing our journey through the book of John. It is called Come, See, Stay. It's an exploration of what it means to actually become a follower of Jesus. What does it mean to be a disciple of this man? Over the last few weeks we've encountered and had a front row seat to some of these amazing times where Jesus interacted with another person and we've seen Jesus and some prospective followers. Some decided to follow Jesus immediately. We have brothers Simon and Andrew, brothers James and John. They were all in right away. Some, like Nicodemus, turned away and couldn't follow. Some, like the Samaritan woman, met Jesus and went back to her city and told everyone else she knew about him. Some, at a wedding, were spared shame and embarrassment and, in the process, enjoyed the best wine they'd ever had in their whole life. Today, in the passage that David just read for us, the narrative shifts to a figure that we've already encountered in the gospel before, John the Baptist. In fact, in this passage today, Jesus doesn't show up at all. He doesn't say anything. Instead, we have John saying things about Jesus. John is teaching us a few things about Jesus. Sometimes you learn stuff in life, maybe it's in school or whatever, and you're pretty sure you'll never use that knowledge again for the rest of your life as long as you live. Stuff like memorizing all the state capitals, when you ever need to know that. Or knowing all the U.S. presidents in chronological order, when will you ever need to know that. Or learning how to write in cursive. Or learning how to drop an egg from a three-story building without cracking the shell at all. Or math stuff, just in general. Like Sokotoa. Like, when's the last time you used Sokotoa? Do you guys remember Sokotoa? I actually used Sokotoa like a couple years ago. So I've used it once in like 25 years. But I did use it one time, Sokotoa. But sometimes we learn stuff and it makes this consistent difference in our lives. Like it makes a difference in our daily, everyday grind. And I think John in this passage gives some information, some knowledge, some teaching to his disciples that has the potential to make a huge difference in our daily life. So let's dig in this morning. So here's the scene. John the Baptist is doing his thing. He is baptizing people out in the Judean countryside. If you heard Christie's sermon a few months back, you know that John was a passionate, fiery, intense dude driven by an ethical code of purity and holiness. The gospel paints him as a prophetic figure sent by God to pave the way for the Messiah who's going to usher in the kingdom of God. John's also related to Jesus, if you remember, probably his cousin. Six months older, he's maybe a little older brother-ish to Jesus. So as like an older brother, he's been out there doing his own ministry before Jesus even gets started with his. He's grinding one repentant person at a time in the wilderness. So back in John 1, we witnessed this amazing scene where John is baptizing people and Jesus shows up. And John in that moment recognizes it's go time for Jesus. So he pronounces, this is the Lamb of God. This is the one who takes away the sins of the world. And John baptizes him on the spot. He's announcing to the world, this is the guy that we've all been waiting for. And as Chrissy said a few months ago, not me, Jesus. John is saying, it's not me, it's Jesus. Focus on him. And a few of John's disciples in that moment actually left John and went to go follow Jesus. So fast forward a bit. So now we're in chapter 3 of John. So here we are, the disciples who have stayed with John, decide not to follow Jesus. They stayed with John. They're worried. Their teacher, John, is holding steady. He's baptizing folks in the wilderness. He's proclaiming repentance like he's always been doing. But there's a new show in town. Like Jesus has set up camp like just over there. And he and his disciples are also baptizing folks, which is not cool. So they come to John and they say, Rabbi, verse 26, 326, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, that guy, he's over there baptizing people, and everyone's going over to him instead of coming to us. Everyone's going over to him instead of coming to us. What are we going to do about it? John, we're with you. We got your back. But that man (laughs) over there is stealing your thunder. He's encroaching on your territory. He's taking all of your potential followers. What are you going to do, John? John, straight as an arrow, just like he always is, says the same thing that he's been saying the whole time. Verse 27, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven, guys. All right, in other words, it's not about me. It's about Jesus, remember? I'm not the Messiah, verse 28. He's the Messiah. You're all fixated on me, but I'm like the groom. The friend, I'm, not, I'm not the groom. I'm the friend of the groom, right? If my followers leave to follow Jesus, if they all go to be part of him and we get to witness that union take place, then I'm satisfied. I'm not threatened by Jesus. I'm not possessive. I'm not angry or worried. I'm 29, filled with joy at his success. I'm happy. 
It's like he's been saying all along, verse 30, he must become greater and greater, I must become less and less. And maybe it's fear of their own status, John's disciples. I mean, who wants to be the disciple of the second best rabbi in town? <laughs> like, might as well be with the first. Or maybe it's out of loyalty to John. His disciples are almost creating competition between these two cousins. They're almost trying to separate John from Jesus. They saw rivalry between the two. They saw tension between the two. And John, in this moment, sets them straight. He's not my rival. He's my friend. We're on the same team. We're doing and want the same thing. My role is to prepare the way, to break up the soil, to shake up the status quo. His job, Jesus' role, is to walk in that way, to establish the kingdom, to be the Messiah that God called him to be. I know my lane. I'm going to stay in my lane. Let him do his thing. John's doing something, I think, very important here. Instead of allowing division to creep into his relationship with Jesus, he reaffirms their unity, that they are together. And for all we know at this time, John's following could have been much larger than Jesus's. Yet even that, he gives up. He's willing to give everything that he has to support Jesus. Jesus. They are absolutely united in John's mind. And to emphasize that point, John says in verse 31, he has come from above and is greater than anyone else. We are of the earth and we speak of earthly things. He is from heaven. He is greater than anyone else. Jesus is not only from the earth, he's also from heaven. So he is the only one who is both human and divine, which is why Jesus comes first. So it's important here, John's not begrudgingly conceding to a stronger opponent. He's wholeheartedly embracing God's will and accepting the supremacy of Jesus. There is only one Savior, he's saying. Verse 34, Jesus is sent by God, John says. He speaks God's words, for God gives him the spirit without limit. He is sent by God, he speaks God's words, and God's given him the spirit without limit. You see, in the past, God had delivered his will through messengers called prophets. Rabbinic literature says that God's spirit would come upon each prophet according to the specific task assigned to that person, empowering them for a set amount of time. And then, after their task was completed, the spirit of God would leave them. Jesus was no ordinary prophet. He didn't have God's spirit for a short amount of time. God gave Jesus the spirit, it says, without limit. The spirit was always with Jesus. Everything he said, everything he did revealed the will of God, and it did so perfectly. So Jesus didn't just deliver God's message. Jesus was God's message. The word made flesh. The best way to know God is to get to know Jesus and to follow him. If you want to know who God is, we get to know Jesus and we follow him. I I think the theological bombshell in all of this is the interconnectedness between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. This is how we get the concept of the Trinity, right? The word Trinity never appears in Scripture. You probably know that. But passages like this speak to the unbreakable union that exists between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Try, they are three. And unity, they are one. Trinity. All right, so to review, we're going fast, but to review. We've got John's followers seeing division between John and Jesus. And John affirms, no, no, we're united, we're together. We're not divided, we're together. And I don't think it's a coincidence that in this same moment, Jesus, John also affirms the unity between the Trinity. God is not divided either. Father, Son, and Spirit, God is one. John will not allow his followers to imagine that there is any division between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. They're all united together as one. Verse 35, the Father loves the Son and has put everything into his hands. They were united. All right, so... Bear with me. This is where I think it gets a little complicated, at least for me. Verse 36, anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. All right. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. God's angry judgment. Another translation says, whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. God's wrath. So I think it's kind of ironic that in a passage that's entirely stressing the unity of God, we find a phrase that has led many to see tension between the Father and the Son. God's wrath remains on them. We might understandably see some tension, some rivalry, some division between God's love on one hand and God's wrath on the other. How do those things go together? And nowhere is that tension, I think, more evident than at the cross, where Jesus dies to save us from our sins. 
And for the past few thousand years, Christians have sifted through Scripture to try to understand the cross. Like, what is happening on the cross? What is the mechanism of salvation? How does Jesus' death unite us to God? How does the cross save us? Our ideas about how that happens in theological terms are called theories of atonement. Theories about how Christ's death repairs what has gone wrong between us and God. So the Bible doesn't spell out the how of the cross as clearly as we might like it to. There are images, there are symbols, there are metaphors, there are hints at it. And from those hints and symbols, we have developed all of these theories of atonement. Most of them are somewhat helpful. One of the prevailing theories that emerged during the Middle Ages and took a lot of strength and power in the Reformation is a theory called the penal substitutionary theory of atonement. And it works like this. Here we go. Humans, collectively and individually, have disobeyed God. They have fallen into sin. God is pure, and God is holy, and God is righteous, and our sinfulness results in God's judgment against us. The consequence of our sin, God's wrath, remains on us. We are separated from God because of that. It's like we've dug ourselves such a deep hole. Our crimes are so great. Our debt is so insurmountable that we cannot atone for it ourselves. We cannot do it ourselves. So God sends Jesus, because God is the only one who could ever pay that incredible debt. And Jesus takes our debt, our punishment, upon himself and substitutes his own death on the cross for the death that we deserved. With me so far? Okay, some nods, good. Okay, so on one hand, God's holy. God demands righteousness. And if we are not righteous, we cannot be in relationship with God. We're dead. We're deep in that hole. We are drowning in debt we can't pay. On the other hand, God is merciful and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in love. That's the refrain of Scripture from the Old Testament to the New. So it seems like we might have some tension here. God cannot be with us because he's holy and righteous, and yet God wants to be with us because he's loving and merciful. According to this theory, the solution to this tension is Jesus. Jesus is like a shield absorbing the wrath of God in order to save us and protect us from the punishment God has to dole out. God the Father comes almost with retributive lightning and thunder, and God the Son absorbs that blow that was meant for us, and like a lightning rod, diverts the punishment into the ground, or in this case, into himself. This idea comes up all the time. Here's a line from uh, the song, In Christ Alone. You guys know this, I'm sure. Till on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. And there is this phrase, right? The wrath of God was satisfied. And it's that idea that sneaks, I think, some division in between God the Father and God the Son. It's as if the Father is over here with wrath and judgment, and then the Son is over here with love and forgiveness. Good cop, bad cop. The result is that we can get two different messages about God, and therefore pretty confused about God's posture towards us. Is God angry at me, disappointed in me, or does God love me? Is God for me, or is God against me? And that question is real, because I know a great many people who live their lives feeling like God is disappointed in them, and God is angry at them. A lot of my friends who grew up Catholic carry around what they almost pridefully call Catholic guilt, that they can never quite escape. One guy shared with me that as a kid, when it would rain outside, his grandma would joke with him, what'd you do to make God send all the rain and punish us with this? Which is kind of funny, and like kind of not at the same time, right? This kind of guilt that we feel and harbor and, and, and build up in ourselves over time can lead us to shame and actually like hating ourselves and seeing ourselves as, as bad and wicked and unlovable. So I'd encountered this theory of atonement for most of my life growing up in the church. As I got older and learned more, something about the whole picture didn't quite sit right with me because it seemed like God wasn't united. As a foster parent, I've learned a lot about the impact that a child's environment can have on their sense of identity and value. And it can go a little bit like this. So here's this picture. Imagine this with me. Picture a child who has a need. She's hungry. 
She's tired. She needs a new diaper. She cries for help. And help comes. A caregiver meets that need. And over time, as her needs are met consistently and repetitively, the child learns that she is safe. And she learns that she is valued. And she learns that when she cries, somebody will come. She learns that she can trust the adult in her life. She forms what we call a secure attachment. She knows she's loved. Picture another scene. A child has a need. She cries for help, but help doesn't come. Or it comes sometimes, but not all the time. Or maybe it's even met with anger. An adult lashes out at the child for crying so much and being so annoying. So the child is confused. And she's disoriented. She expressed a need, but help didn't come to her. And she comes to believe over time that she's not valued. And she forms what's called an insecure attachment. She can't trust her caregivers, and she struggles to trust anyone at all. She might even shut down entirely and stop crying altogether when she has a need because she's not sure that help will come. She doesn't know that she's loved. Well, I struggle to picture God as that inconsistent parent. Unpredictable, sometimes oriented towards me and sometimes oriented towards me with anger. Or that God is so angry with me that God had to take it out on Jesus in order to be able to be free to love me. Maybe you felt a little bit of that uncertainty yourself. Unsure if God is for you or against you. Unsure if you could trust God. Unsure if you were loved by God. Unsure that if you cried out, would God hear you? Would God help Or not? Well, a a guy named Peter or Paul Petter Waldenstrom, a Swedish theologian, about 150 years ago was asking these same questions. He was troubled by penal substitutionary theory of atonement. His mantra for his whole life, he was a theologian, his mantra was, what do the scriptures say? Which is a pretty good mantra for your life. Like, what do the scriptures say about this? So he decided he was going to launch a two-year mission to try to find a scriptural basis for penal substitutionary theory of atonement. And what he found and developed became part of the theological foundation of our whole denomination. We are, as a church, part of the Evangelical Covenant denomination. And Waldenstrom's theories and ideas and posture became a huge part of the foundation of how we think about God and the covenant. Two years of research he did. I'm going to boil it down to like three minutes. (laughs) Okay, ready? Um, It's caveat, right? So much more could be said about this. I'm not trying to like definitively say something that like settles the conversation once and for all. I'm trying to continue the conversation by postulating an idea. So like hear me say caveat, right? Much more could be said. Okay, here, here's what he said. Here's what he concluded. Jesus gave his life on the cross, right? And he did accomplish a reconciliation between humanity and God. True statement. But in all the passages Waldenstrom studied, he didn't find any that said the cross changed God from being angry at us to being able to be merciful to us. In theological terms, he didn't find any evidence of God's wrath being appeased or satisfied on the cross. Instead, Waldenstrom argued, the cross didn't change God at all. The cross, he said, changed us. And that's a huge difference. Jesus didn't change God. Jesus changed us. Some verses. Christ's sacrifice, Hebrews 9, 14, purifies our consciences and sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. On the cross, the Lamb of God, John 1, 29, took away our sin and made us righteous. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Waldenstrom found that the atoning sacrifice of Christ reconciled humanity to God, not God to humanity. So on the cross, Christ wasn't really absorbing God's wrath so that God could finally love us. Rather, it's more like Christ was absorbing our rebellion, changing us so that we could finally receive God's love that was always there. God's love didn't need to be restored because God's love was never lost in the first place. Even in the Old Testament, he decided, atonement wasn't retributive. When animals were offered in sacrifice, it's clear that the death that provide, it's clear that it wasn't death that provided atonement. The blood poured out was a symbol of life, and that life was what washed away and overcame death. 
On the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament, the day when the whole community was forgiven and restored to God, the priests laid their hands on a goat, and confessing all the sins of the community, the goat wasn't killed. The goat was sent away to live in the wilderness. It was set free. Their sins weren't removed by punishment through death. Their sins were removed because the goat carried the sins away. So the beauty of this theory is that it allows us to see God's love and righteousness working in harmony rather than opposition. Instead of God's love and righteousness fighting against each other, they're working in harmony. This is the unity that I think John is stressing to his disciples in this passage. The Father and the Son and the Spirit are united. Don't try to separate them from each other. The enemy is the one who divides and separates and conquers. But the Son and the Father and the Spirit are united, and together they say one thing, and that one thing is you are loved. You are deeply and personally and permanently unflinchingly loved. So God's wrath against sin is not because God hates us, but because God loves us and will not leave us to die or be separated from God forever. God's anger is against the sin that has infected us, the disease that has so twisted us that we turn from God. And instead of choosing God, we choose violence and vengeance and selfishness and lust and greed, and we see rivalry out there instead of unity. We're afraid, we're fearful, so we lash out and we use our wrath to punish people and destroy our enemies. Or maybe worst of all, we punish people in God's name sometimes. We imagine ourselves as the righteous ones, worthy to administer God's wrath on those who we've decided really deserve it. And these destructive choices root themselves in us like a disease, a disease so pervasive and so rotten that we can come to view ourselves, like I said before, with disgust. And we can't even recognize God's love when it comes down to us in human form. So, yeah, I think God's angry. Angry at the disease destroying his beloved creation. Waldenstrom didn't think we needed punishment. He thought we needed healing. A healing God accomplished through Christ. So back to the question, does God love me or is God angry at me? Is God for me? Is God against me? Waldenstrom said that scripture teaches us that no action of ours can ever change the heart of God. God is consistent and the same. And he is always for us and always for our salvation. So there's no walking on eggshells around God's love, wondering if it's going to be there. There's no worrying that we might get it wrong or that we'll be too much or we'll be not enough. We will get it wrong sometimes. But that's okay. Because in Christ, we have assurance that all the sin that separates us from God has been removed and carried away by him. When we do sin, we have the assurance that through the blood of Christ, God is not out to punish us, but to purify us, to make us whole. That is what the atonement is about. Not anger, but a love so deep and so constant and so true that it makes things right. Nothing can separate us from it. We can know that and trust it and rest in it for all time. And then we are called to extend that kind of love, not God's wrath, to others. I want to pray for us. And as I do, I would invite you to visualize for yourself the picture of God's steadfast love. Like, what does God's steadfast love look like to you? How do you picture it? And this may sound a little bit weird, but maybe even like put your hand over your heart as you do so, so that you can feel a physical sensation of your heart being held. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, your love for us is immense. We read just a few verses before these verses that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And we also read in these verses that you, the Father, love the Son and that you are love directed towards us. And yet we are blinded by that. Sin in our lives, we're blinded by our own twistedness. We sometimes can't see how deep and how powerful and how true and how real your love is. And it causes us to lash out in anger and in frustration and in fear and insecurity. So I pray, Lord, that you would impress upon us the depth and the pervasiveness and the constancy and the faithfulness of your love for us. And that out of that faithfulness, we would live not fearfully, but knowing that you are our Savior and that you love us. And nothing can ever change that. You don't change your mind. You don't second guess. We can believe it. I pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus. For his sake, amen.